I'd just like to share with you again that I think it's worth supporting risks. And I'll share a story of my own, uh, which we are reaping the benefits of in form of uh, a new field that evolved in India, which is called nanotoxicology. And this is all about how a nation should support risk and uh, how it emerges as a world leader. It's all about a meeting that we had with chemical engineers in the Michigan State University in East Lansing on a very cold November afternoon. And uh, immediately as I had a meeting with them, these were chemical engineers who were actually synthesizing fullerenes in water. And they wanted to look at the safety of these fullerenes that can be used for various applications. And they asked me whether I could uh, look at the safety of these fullerenes. Uh, so the first thing I thought whether, how do we begin uh, looking at these small, very, very small, tiny objects, and how we look at the safety in uh, systems that we use. So of course, uh, being employed in an institution, the first thing I had to do was to, to look at uh, the permissions that are required to undertake these studies. And uh, that's where I think support for risk comes. And uh, as soon as I wrote to the then director of the institution, uh, within, I think, 24 hours, I got a response from him that I think you should go ahead. And that's the start of a new discipline in this country. And I think that's how risk should be supported if we have to move forward as a country, or for that matter, any country. The best part was the speed at which this was supported. And if you look at the timelines, we started somewhere in, in November of 20, 2005. And 2006, we had a publication with the group in uh, Michigan State University. That too in, uh, in a very top class journal. And uh, as they said, it was one of the best papers they'd actually published as chemical engineers. And this became one of the most highly cited as well as most downloaded article of the journal at that point in time. Coming to uh, nanomaterials, as we're talking about, uh, human beings are only known by the materials they've ever used. So we know people from the Stone Age, from Bronze Age, from Iron Age. We don't know the names, but we know human beings are from uh, those ages. We are currently in plastic and silicon age, and we are headed towards the nano age. So I think although nano is not a material by its own, it's the size of the material, but I think it's very important that we look into the safety of these materials as well. And so therefore, and not only that, I think nano is one such technology that is very unifying in nature. We had biotechnology, we had information technology. And nanotechnology, per se, is going to take over all other technologies as it's going to be unifying, it's going to be all pervasive. And it's already into several fields of applications. In terms of uh, the size, one nanometer is approximately half the diameter of DNA. It's approximately a billionth of your hair. Uh, a cell is approximately 8,000 times that of a nanometer. So now you can visualize as to the kind of materials we're looking at and how we assess their safety. And this gives you a whole list of different kinds of uh, things that, that have been showcased here in terms of the size uh, versus a nanometer. So the first thing was to look at why uh, nanomaterials would be toxic in the first place. So if you look at the size, if you look at a sphere and you break it down into smaller particles or smaller spheres, the surface area actually exponentially rises and therefore the reactivity rises as well. And that was the main reason why we looked at uh, the safety concerns of nanomaterials. On the other hand, there was uh, also uh, a paper which said that if you bring it down to approximately five nanometer in size, 60% of the molecules are at the surface. So it make, makes the, any material very, very reactive and that's why there was a concern for safety and that's how we started working. But as soon as we started working, uh, we figured out there a lot of safety issues. And there were more than, till date, almost more than 1,800 consumer products in the market containing nanomaterials. But there were a lot of safety, uh, there were a lot of issues when we wanted to look at the safety. Uh, not only in terms of the coatings uh, that are on these materials, but also the characterization, the visualization, the dose metrics, and so on and so forth. And each of these we had to grapple with before we could actually take up the, uh, the science of nanotoxicology in, in our institute. So I think this itself took us a while, but as I said in the very beginning, speed for any challenge that you take up is very, very important to reach the logical conclusion. And if this was not enough, uh, because of the shape and size, because of the uh, 
kind of exposures we were having, uh, it comp uh, made the problem even more complex. Um, and so we'll, we had to look at each of these issues in the entirety, and for each of them, we had to provide a solution. So we, again, um, looked at different uh, approaches, um, right from in vitro, which means inside the vitreous, which is cell, or uh, uh, which is glass. Then we looked at in vivo in animal species, and also looked at uh, computational solutions, which were in silico. And all these three combined provided us a lot of insight into how these nanomaterials behave in the biological system. And that was not enough. We, we understand that everything that we use goes into this, uh, to the environment. And so therefore, we looked at various models that can be utilized to assess the impact of these nanomaterials in the environment, uh, right from the bacteria, which is ubiquitous, right within our guts all the way up to the environment, to uh, looking at various uh, organisms in different trophic levels, uh, and the kind of biochemistry or the kind of approaches that need to be uh, applied or employed to understand the mechanism of the safety of the nanoparticles. But at each level, we had to undertake very innovative um, thought processes ahead uh, to ensure that we can understand and we can predict the toxicity or safety of these nanomaterials uh, very effectively. Uh, also to let you know that Safety does not have its own domains. Toxicology defines the, the, the domains of safety, and that was very important for us to ensure that what we say um, can be utilized by common man and by the industry. So this was once an example where now we are looking at how these nanoparticles enter the cell and how many of them actually enter the cell. So I think it was, it was imperative that we look at the most high resolution uh, kind of instruments that we had, and that was the transmission electron microscope. Having said that, it is very complex to uh, undertake these kind of experiments. It does uh, tell us where these particles are uh, going, but what we did was to also look at in parallel another equipment that is very quick um, and can give you answers in a very short span of time, and we hypothesized that if we look at a flow cytometer uh, and we fire a laser on these cells, if the nanoparticles actually enter these cells, uh, only the site scatter goes up and not the forward scatter. And therefore, we are able to differentiate between these cells that have actually uh, taken up the nanoparticles versus the cells that have actually got particles around them. And this was the hypothesis that we tried to develop and tried to take up further. For everything that you do, you have to have validation. So we went ahead and did validation using electron microscope. And you actually, uh, we could see that these particles are getting inside the uh, cells, human cells, uh, and getting all the way up to the nucleus. And when we looked at a similar situation using flow cytometer, we again found that the, the changes were very apparent and we could actually identify and predict what are the kind of uh, nanoparticles that are getting inside. And that actually changed the way we looked at um, the uptake of nanoparticles, and it was very, uh, a new method that got developed, not only in human cells, which I said were almost uh, seven to 8,000 times that of nanomaterials, but when we wanted to look into the bacteria, these are very small, tiny cells, and then we looked at bacteria, and again, um, in terms of observation, I would say, uh, whatever you observe, uh, you should observe in depth, and this was a good example where we could see uh, bacteria actually dividing with nanoparticles inside, and we thought, uh, how we can see up to how many generations these nanoparticles are actually remaining in the bacteria uh, once exposed. So we looked at several generations, and again, we went back to um, the flow cytometer instead of electron microscopy. And we could find that almost up to three generations we could uh, detect nanoparticles inside the bacteria that were exposed only once. So I think this was a phenomenal uh, sort of uh, development of a, a very nice method uh, that was being used then by several other people in the, in the world. And as I mentioned, we were looking also at computational methods where we could predict how a, a nanoparticle would interact with uh, macromolecules or proteins inside the cell once it enters. And this was once an example where we looked at um, a graphene oxide which is hydrated, which has water, and how it can prevent the protein from getting um, denatured versus a protein that interacts with a graphene which is uh, dehydrated or unhydrated, and therefore we could actually observe the proteins getting distorted. This was a fantastic example of doing science at the interface of different fields. 
Uh, here was a good example where we were looking at a biological problem. We were trying to solve it. It's a 100% biological problem being solved by a 100% computational approach and being published in a 100% chemistry journal. So we couldn't get more interdisciplinary in that sense. So I thought this was a good um, idea to take forward and, and we had several collaborations around this uh, kind of approaches. In doing all this, uh, of course, time was of the essence and we built an entire repertoire of expertise in the institution for which it is now known globally. And, uh, but as you'll observe, I think it, the, uh, the speed was key to all this development happening. And at all, the, all these points, uh, the fact that risk was being supported at all levels, I think is what is most important. Now coming to the impact of these, uh, if you look at the first publication that we have somewhere in 2009, uh, this article was published somewhere in January of 2009 and within three months, that is in April 2009, uh, it was featured in the Science for European Policy of the European Commission in the special issue on nanomaterials. And this is almost cited around 500 times in the most cited article of the journal. So it shows if your study design and if your um, composition of your hypothesis is fantastic, I think people are looking forward to this kind of work that can be uh, taken up for policy. I think that was, uh, and doing it right here in the city in Lucknow. The second impact was of course coming up with a new method. Uh, and I think this is very important again when you develop new methods, not only the students take pride uh, in having a method in their name, but also it becomes global. So whatever science we do locally becomes globally uh, acceptable and becomes again something which is uh, a, a new method that was developed from, from here itself and became global and it is now being used uh, globally. Similarly, um, this paper that we did um, on hydration patterns of graphene became uh, very well recognized globally and people are now trying to utilize this kind of a method or methodology to understand uh, the behavior of nanomaterials when they get inside the, uh, the body and interact with the cells. Not only this, I think uh, uh, the, when the bibliographic analysis was done, in the areas of pharmacology, pharmaceuticals, as well as in toxicology, the three combined. Uh, the paper that you see as highlighted at number seven uh, stood up as, at the top 10 uh, within the period of 2009-2014. Uh, not only that, um, after developing this kind of a expertise in the institute, we were able to train people from seven European countries who went back and established this kind of uh, an expertise in their own countries and that's how they prospered in their own countries. I think that was phenomenal. Uh, within a very short span of time, we started in 2006 and these workshops were organized in 2011. So you can see within five years time, we were globally competitive and people were trained uh, at our institute to go abroad and establish it in their own respective countries. Not only that, we also came up with a policy guidance uh, document for safe handling of nanomaterials, which later on became the guidelines uh, for the government as well. When you look at now the timelines, I think these are the summary slides which you look at and you see the speed at which things were done. We initiated it in sometime uh, in November of 2005. The first impact that you see or the setting up facilities happened in 2006. We established a society of nanomaterials in 2007. We did an international conference in 2008 within two years of our establishing the uh, facilities at the institute and we were already globally competitive at that point in time. Within that period, we were having international collaborations as well. So that's another important area that we need to be careful. As soon as you uh, launch a new area, you need to collaborate so that you can come up uh, to the best globally. In 2010, we had a European Union project, which was linking India and seven European countries. And we, as I mentioned to you, we were able to uh, get people to get trained in these areas. Within the same time, we also established a major facility across the country and uh, later on we got a uh, EU FP7 grant as well. That was a flagship project of European Union. Not only that, I think uh, we established later on some advanced facilities in 2016. 2017, we published a book on nanotoxicology uh, pertaining to both experimental and computational perspectives as I uh, showed you earlier. In 2017, uh, based on the contributions that were made here uh, in Lucknow, I was awarded the honorary doctorate or DSC uh, from the University of Bradford, and perhaps the only one outside of the UK since the inception in, in, uh, in the 50 years of the history of, the, of that university. 
And currently, because of the efforts that were made by our institute, CSIR stands among the top five uh, in the world in area of nanomaterial toxicology. So I think this is a story that I feel that if at that point in time in 2005 the risk, risk was not supported, we would not have come to a point where we are globally competitive. And I think uh, for each of this, the more we support risk in science and of course have a focused approach, the more we are likely to succeed, not only in this country, but I think it's true for everywhere in the world, for any form or any kind of uh, subject that we want to delve into. I think this was a short uh, story that I wanted to share with you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.